Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Um, this is the question I want to ask today. I want to look at just a very simple confluent layer of cells plated on a Petri disk and ask, what forces do you need to um, construct a very simple model of this cell layer? And so the, the talk's gonna have three parts. First of all, I'm going to ask, what do I want this model to do? The sort of experimental evidence I'm trying to, um, trying to model. Then how to put in forces so I can get my model to behave in this way. And then ask, does it work? And then a big gap at the end, we'd like some more experiments to see if we're on the right track. And before I start, thank you very much to, um, work, yeah, to Guan Ming Zhang, who's done all the hard work, and also to collaborators, experimental and theoretical, who've been in at the beginning of this work. So the way theoretical physicists have started to think about biology is in terms of active matter. And Schrodinger, a very long time ago, when he wasn't busy doing quantum mechanics, started to think about biology. And he said that living systems evade the decay to equilibrium, which is a very nice way of thinking about them. Living systems are alive. They're continually taking energy from their surroundings and using it to do work. And that's what physicists mean by active matter, material which is out of equilibrium, which is able to do things because you're continually pumping in energy to each particle, chemical energy usually, and then these things are moving around. Now, we've been thinking a lot about the theories of active matter. And in particular, I'm going to concentrate on what happens when you have lots of active particles together. So you could think perhaps of E. coli bacteria. And the theories I'm going to talk about work for elongated active particles. I'll probably use the word pneumatic. And for that, I just mean long, thin, elongated particles. And the first thing you see when you put these particles together, for example, if you put a load of bacteria together, is a state like this. And so what you're seeing is, is a state where these bacteria are moving around and you're seeing lots of vorticity, lots of swirling turbulent like behavior. And that state has become known as active turbulence. And if we look at cells, you see very much the same thing. You see swirly sorts of behavior. This stuff actually starts going round and round and you see a turbulent like state. And if you measured the velocity field of those cells, it looks very similar in the experiments to the theories of active pneumatics. In particular, you see these sudden jets of velocity. The cells start suddenly moving collectively in a given direction. And you also see this sort of swirliness, this active pneumatic type vorticity. The other thing you tend to see um, in these active pneumatics are places which we call defects, places where you get a certain configuration of the bacteria, of the long, thin particles. And these places are special because these are rather long-lived um, long configurations of the, of the bacteria. You can get things like this, which is a comet-like defect. It looks like a comet, and we call that a plus a half defect. We can get things like this, which have this threefold symmetry, which is a minus a half defect. And you can see those uh, in these bacteria, and you can also see them in cells. And this is some work we did quite a long time ago now, trying to map cells onto one of these active pneumatic theories. So the first question is, why are we considering cells, which on average are round, I know they're not around the whole time, but they're on average round. How, why can we map those onto elongated particles? And the answer is that if you look at a cell at any particular time, it's likely to be elongated in a certain direction. And so we can put one of these things here, which is called a director, which measures the long axis of the cell. So what I'm plotting here is the long axis of the cell. And if I, and I take these long axes, and draw them in a way you can actually see what's going on, what you can see is that you get these topological defects, this comet-like structure 
of the long axes of the cell. And this comet-like structure uh, persists in time. That's why it's sort of a useful concept. And it moves, it moves towards the head of the cell. You're getting motile defects in these systems. And so that immediately gives us the first question, which confused us for a long time, which is that I've said that we need elongated particles to see this active pneumatic behavior and to see these defects and cells are on average round. So that's a bit strange, uh, but that's okay because maybe you can have forces like this acting on a cell which tend to elongate them. And I'm going to use the word extensile forces for ones which take an elongated cell and make it longer. So that would be all right, but, but I think we all know, um, biologists tell me cells are contractile. And by contractile forces, what I'm going to mean is ones which restore the cell to a circular shape. So extensile stretch is the thing, and then we'd expect it to have this active pneumatic behavior, but contractile squishes it to being a circle. And that's probably what's happening physically. And the way you can tell the difference in a monolayer is looking at the defects because extensile defects move towards their head, like this one is, and contractile defects move towards their tail. And to make things even more confusing, when you do experiments, this is experimental work by Lakshmi Balasubramanian in Benoit Ledoux's group. When you do experiments and look at which way the defects are moving, in normal monolayers of MDCK cells, they move towards their head. So here's a defect, here's the velocity field, and it's moving towards its head. But if you knock out the cell-cell junctions, these defects suddenly change direction and move towards their tail. They're behaving in a contractile way. So we've ended up with loads of questions. What are the forces you have to put in to get a minimal model of a confluent cell layer, sort of two-dimensional cell layer? And we want a model which predicts active turbulence. We know we need elongated cells and um, we'd like to work out a way to get these topological defects. First of all, we have to find them and then we have to have them moving towards their head and towards their tail. What do we have to change to, to, to change that? And that's quite a lot, of, you know, it's gonna have a pretty complicated model. Can we just do a simple model which gives us all these different, all these different things? And I'm gonna show you how, but first of all, let me just um, take a minute out to, to, to tell you why this might have something to do with cancer. This is somebody else's work entirely. This is the paper I'm taking this picture from. And what these people found was that they were able to see these topological defects in um, the mesothelium. And his, here you can see one of these, these minus topological defects, which, which has this threefold symmetry. Here's the plus a half defect. Here's the sort of comet-like shape. And um, the argument in this paper was that cancer cells are able to burrow through, the epi through the this epithelium more easily near a topological defect. And the reason is the flows set up near a topological defects um, stop the layer um, rejecting the cancer cells. So there is some evidence, I'm not sure if I believe it, people are at least thinking that there might be a relation between um, topological defects and properties of the mesothelium related to cancer. Okay, but we wanna do something really simple. We wanna really just understand um, how do I put in forces in a simple model to end up with, with, with all the, the, the properties that I, that I showed you. And I'm just gonna show you the model as a, as a picture. This is called a phase field model. Those of you that are used to vertex models, it's sort of the same idea, but what this model has is, is a better representation of the junctions between cells. 
So our model is essentially a load of cells. Um, you can think of them, you could think of them if you didn't have active forces as a bubble raft, but then the active forces make them move around. What active forces should we put on? Well, for a single cell, we pretty much know the answer. Um, single cells move because they're pushed forwards by the lamellipodia, by the actin filaments pushing the lamellipodia. And the way you'd model that is just by a force, just by a polar force moving forwards. The cells are just pulled around. That's the very simplest thing you could do. That's all you have. What's going to happen is they're going to get longer and longer. And so you need them to be pulled back into a circular shape. And to do that, you need a contractile force, which is produced by the actomyosin machinery inside the cell, which tends to contract them back to being round. So we put a polar force on our model and we saw what happened. What happens is that if the polar force is very small, the cells jam. These are the positions of the center of mass of each little cell. And you can see they don't go very far, you just get a jammed state. If you then increase the magnitude of the polar force, the cells start moving around. This is the trajectory of each cell. And you can see that they're moving relative to each other. And so you get a liquid-like state. And you can also get what's called flocking if you take those forces and you tend to make them move in the direction of the velocity. For the experts, this is really just a V-check level-like mechanism and the cells can flock like this. But this is the liquid-like state. They're moving relative to each other. This is the one we'd like to look like active turbulence. And, and it doesn't. It looks like a nice liquid, but you don't see topological defects and you don't see these active turbulent-like behaviors. So that doesn't work. And actually, if we thought about it, you know, it sort of makes sense that it doesn't work. And that's because of contact inhibition of locomotion, which says that if you have cells in a colony, you don't get lame lamellopodia. The cells don't want to go anywhere. They don't form polar forces, forces which just pull them in a certain direction. So, so what do you have instead? If you don't have lamellopodia pushing these things around, what's making them move? What's mediating the forces which makes these cells move? And there's a very nice experiment, quite an old one now, which gives a clue. These are monolayers of um, MCF, I think, but anyway, they're, they're, they're cell monolayers, okay? And this is the normal active turbulence. And then what the experimentalists did was knock out the cell-cell junctions with RAB5A. Somehow they mucked up the junctions between cells and these cells just took off. They did this flocking-like behavior and they all took off in a certain direction. Here's the velocity. This is the velocity of the wild type. If you muck up the cell-cell junctions, the velocity becomes enormous. Beautiful difference for a biological experiment. And, and this is a movie showing the same thing. The one on the left is doing active turbulence happily. The one on the right, you're mucking up the cell-cell junctions and you get this, um, this flocking-like state. You can see them really taking off this one looks like active turbulence. This one, let me play it again. Everything, um, maybe a mistake trying to do this again. There we go. And everyone takes off like mad. So that suggests that cell cell junctions have something to do with it. And it actually makes a lot of sense. You know, what else have you got pulling these cells around but their neighbors? And so what we did is we said, right, what do I need physically? What have I got here? Well, physically, I have interactions between cells, the cell-cell junctions pulling on each other. Probably these interactions should be contractile because we know that cells are contractile, so the actomyosin machinery is trying to exert contractile interactions in a given cell. And they certainly have to be active forces because the system keeps moving. It doesn't relax to equilibrium. 
And then we were confused again because we want these things to be long and thin. We know the cells have to be elongated and we think that extensile forces are needed to elongate the cell. Whereas what we've actually got is contractile ones. So we thought we'd give it a go and put these contractile ones in the model. So we put the forces pulling on each other through the cell-cell junctions using contractile forces, put them in the model, and this is what happened. For some reason, the contractile forces were actually elongating the cells, and you ended up with a regular lattice of cells. Looks a bit like an epithelial layer. If you turn down the adhesion, this layer starts sort of wriggling around in an elastic-like way. You get topological defects. And these topological defects, here's my defect, here's the long axis of the cell, and there's the velocity field. The defects move towards their tails. I'll show you the same thing in a movie. This is how the cell level layer works. But, you know, why do, why do contractile forces elongate the cell? I've said you need to, this other direction of forces to elongate the cell. And the reason is that we're looking at forces between neighbors. So let's think about the force on this cell in the middle. I've got contractile forces in the neighbors. So for this one, contractile means that it goes outwards in this direction and inwards from the ends. It's trying to make it round again. So it's going in this direction. So the force it's exerting on its neighbor is in this direction. Similarly with this one, the force this one is exerting on its neighbor is in this direction. And then same thing happens here and the force on the middle cell, due to contractile pulling from its neighbors, is actually in this direction, it actually elongates the cell. So that's great. We've understood why, and we understand why these things are a bit elongated. We've got contractile forces, which is physically what we wanted, and we've got cells which are extended. We've also got defects which move towards their tails. But remember, I showed you that picture which says that we can see defects which move towards the tails and defects which move towards their heads in these systems. So how could we change it? And the answer is that you can change it by allowing the shape of the cells to fluctuate, by actually having completely random noise on the shape of the cells. And if that noise is different along the long axis of the cell and perpendicular to the long axis of the cell, what you find is that the velocity of a defect can cross over from negative contractile-like to positive extensile-like. So if you put on this noise, this is the sort of pattern you get. You completely muck up this lattice. You get defects moving towards their heads, but you get loads more of them, and they're actually really quite, they, they don't last for so long. And you tend to get local ordering of cells like this. You get them ordering in a line, and then you get ones which are perpendicular, where the long axis is perpendicular at the ends. So that's my conclusions. In order to get this active pneumatic behavior, we can get it from what we would have guessed physically by putting just quite simply active contractile intercellular interactions into the model and perhaps adding shape fluctuations. And of course, the next step is that this um, lends itself to lots and lots of different experiments because uh, it would be great to have measurements now of cell shapes and the fluctuations, the changes in cell shapes in different systems and see if this fits in in any way with the picture I've talked about here. Thank you very much for listening.